हेलो स्टूडेंट्स वेलकम बैक टू अनदर एपिसोड ऑफ वाजीराम एंड रवि डेली करंट अफेयर एनालिस्ट टुडे वी विल बी टेकिंग अप फाइव न्यूज आइटम्स आउट ऑफ विच द फर्स्ट थ्री आर ऑफ इमेंस इंपॉर्टेंस फॉर द अपकमिंग मेन्स ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी फोर एग्जामिनेशन सो विल स्टार्ट विद द फर्स्ट टॉपिक दैट इज इलीगल कोल माइनिंग वट आर द कॉजेज बिहाइंड इट एंड हाउ एग्जैक्टली इज इट फंक्शनिंग इन इंडिया नेक्स्ट वील टेक अप द हंड्रेड एंड ट्वेंटी वन हंड्रेड एंड ट्वेंटी फिफ्थ कॉन्स्टिट्यूशनल अमेंडमेंट बिल दैट डील्स विद विलेज एंड म्यूनसिपल काउंसिल्स बींग इस्टेब्लिश इन द सिक्स शेड्यूल्ड एरियाज थर्ड वील टेक अप द रिसेंट सुप्रीम कोर्ट जजमेंट विच हैज रीटरेटेड द वैलिडिटी एंड द लीगैलिटी ऑफ द राइट ऑफ स्टेट्स टू टैक्स माइनिंग फोर्थ वील टेक अप द हैप्पीनेस कमिटी दैट हैज बीन सेट अप बाई केरला हाई कोर्ट टू टेक अप ग्रीवांसिस ऑफ जुडिशियल ऑफिसर्स इन द स्टेट एंड लास्ट वील टेक अप the issue of ai and the environmental costs attached with it after that we'll take up some prelim snippets as well so be sure to join in so first topic of the day is illegal coal mining as we know this practice is continuing in india in spite of efforts by both state and union government as well as the judiciary so this topic is relevant for gs1 distribution of key natural resources across the world and in india as well and we'll be like taking a look at this problem comprehensively what is the importance of coal sector especially for india india happens to have the fourth largest reserves of coal in the entire world and because of that it is expected that coal is going to be and going to remain a key pillar of our energy security now in spite of having the fourth highest uh, amount of reserves of coal india still is the second largest importer which reflects a dissonance or a gap in the demand vis-a-vis -vis the supply now apart from that 55% of india's energy needs are met through coal out of which 70% of electricity generation takes place in thermal power plants that are mostly powered by coal and finally it is also a very labor intensive sector that is it creates a lot of skilled and unskilled employment and because of these reasons coal sector is of great importance for india now moving on to the aspects and the reasons behind this practice that is illegal coal mining well this can be attributed to the first stage of nationalization of coal that took place in 1970s so what it started with nationalization of coking coal in 1971 which was later followed by nationalization of non coking coal as well in 1973 now coking coal is used in production of steel and non coking coal is coal that is for other purposes so both these sources of coal were nationalized and these were nationalized under under the central act of mines nationalization act this act became the mainstay of this policy of nationalizing coal which had the effect that it scuttled private sector participation and coal became a monopoly coal production became a monopoly of the indian state this led to a wipe out of the private sector and thus created this room for emergence of a black market now another issue related with this absence of private sector is that the production has not been able to keep up with the demand this has led to a situation where the demand constantly outstrips the supply and this excess demand has to be met through illegal sources third is the issue that coal bearing areas happen to be uh, one of the most uh, backward areas and districts of our country riddled with poverty and unemployment it is these factors which create a popular support for coal mafias and individuals engaging in coal mining because these illegal coal mines provide opportunity for income for a large number of people in these areas lastly uh, no second fourth it is the issue of poor implementation of regulations due to poor quality of monitoring and verification which leads to rampant illegal coal mining and lastly there have also been evidences and uh, instances of political support being extended to coal mafias 
विच हैज अगेन बीन अ रीजन फॉर वाई दिस प्रैक्टिस ऑफ इलीगल कोल माइनिंग कंटिन्यूज टू थ्राइव टूडे नाउ वट आर द रिस्क इन्वॉल्व इन इलीगल कोल माइनिंग फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल इट इज द इशू ऑफ सेफ्टी इक्विपमेंट द इंडिविजुअल्स हु आर वर्किंग इन दीज इलीगल कोल माइंस दे डू नॉट रिसीव एनी सॉर्ट ऑफ सेफ्टी इक्विपमेंट फॉर देयर प्रोटेक्शन फर्दर मोर दे आर पुअरली और इवन इन सम केसेज एंटरिंग दीज माइंड विदाउट एनी सॉर्ट ऑफ ट्रेनिंग दिस अगेन इज अ इशू एंड रिस्क इन्वॉल्व द रिस्क दैट इन्वॉल्व नॉट ओनली पॉसिबिलिटीज ऑफ डिसेबिलिटी बट इवन डेथ थर्ड इलीगल कोल माइनिंग टेक्स प्लेस थ्रू रेडिमेंट्री टेक्निक्स दैट आर प्रिमेटिव इन नेचर एंड कॉस्ट इफेक्टिव सच एज रैट होल माइनिंग और सरफेस माइनिंग एज वी नो रैट होल माइनिंग हैज बीन बैंड बाई एन जी टी बट दिस प्रैक्टिस कंटिन्यूज टू थ्राइव स्पेशली इन नॉर्थ ईस्ट नाउ अदर इशूज एंड अदर रिस्क एसोसिएटेड विद इलीगल कोल माइनिंग इज द रिस्क ऑफ रेस्पिरेटरी डिजीजेस सच एज द रिस्क ऑफ सिलिकोसिस that is silica entering into the lungs of coal workers and this is also known as black lung disease another respiratory risk involved in this is that of pneumoconiosis so these are some of the diseases that are affecting coal workers and their health apart from that coal workers in these illegal coal mines are extremely vulnerable to cave-ins explosions and floodings as well in addition to that a lot of dangerous chemicals are constantly being exposed to these coal workers such as lead and mercury lastly these workers are suffering due to abject neglect from the state as well as rampant exploitation by those operating these illegal coal mines now we have these uh, factors responsible for these illegal coal mines continuing in india as well as the risks involved to the workers who are working in these mines what should be our way forward how do we tackle this issue let's take it up now so what are the measures that are being proposed or being pursued by indian state to curb this practice of illegal coal mining first of all India has started uh, in the past decade India has opened the private sector for commercial coal mining this is intended to create a robust private sector that is going to meet this excess demand over supply and in, in and introduce efficiency as well as economy in indian mining sector apart from that technological aids have been used uh, robustly to curb this practice of illegal coal mining uttam app has been launched to ensure that the quality of coal that is mined and supplied to uh, end use industries is of the appropriate quality apart from that online coal clearance system and coal allocation monitoring system is to ensure that the coal mines allotted by coal india to states or private entities is being allotted through the right channels and right procedures apart from that we also have another important app that is khan prabhari app this is a mobile based app which allows individuals to click photos of areas where illegal coal mining is taking place and upload these photos while by uh, geo tagging them that is the location of the photo where the photo is taken gets attached and uploaded and this information is sent to the proper authorities to curb this action similarly another mine another application that is uh, being used for the same purpose is coal mine surveillance and management system this essentially performs the same function it allows citizens to report instances of illegal coal mining but this is a web based platform that is that something that you can uh, access on your uh, digital devices apart from that what other measures should india consider to curb this practice of illegal coal mining old mines which are often left unsealed these become ready grounds for these illegal coal mine operators to function so sealing of these old abandoned mines or open coal seams is very important all mines that have uh, reached the end of their life should be sealed with concrete pourings concrete pourings to seal the mouth of these old abandoned mines and lastly training and liaisoning with different state agencies to update them 
to the latest methods and techniques being used by these illegal coal miners is one of the suggestions that India should try to implement to curb this practice of illegal coal mining. So taking up uh, further, this topic is important for mains 2024 examination as well. So please try this practice question, discuss the factors responsible for persistence of illegal coal mining in India, suggest measures to curb illegal coal mining, treat this as a 15 marker and write it in, try to write it in 250 words. Now we take up the second article for the day that deals with the 125th constitutional amendment bill. This bill is yet to become an act that is this amendment is yet to be uh, inserted into the constitution. However, there are certain hurdles that have been preventing its uh, passage in both Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha. Regarding this, a meeting was taken up uh, between the Home Ministry as well as some representatives of Northeastern states and a committee has been formed under the uh, chairmanship of Union Minister of State Nityanand Rai to ensure that these hurdles are cleared. So let's take up the situation in Northeast with the vis-a-vis -vis, uh, 125th Constitutional Amendment Bill. So this bill deals with the local self-government. So let's have a look at the evolution of local self-government in India. So India can trace its uh, heritage, its legacy of local self-government to colonial times with the first municipal uh, corporation being established in 1688 in Madras. This was followed by municipal corporations being set up in Bombay and Calcutta as well. in 1726. So with this, uh, we can say that th this marks the beginning of uh, local self-government in India. However, after independence, a crucial thrust was devoted towards local self-government based on the recommendations of Balwant Rai Mehta Committee. This committee recognized the importance of Panchayati Raj institutions in order to uh, uh, ensure better functioning of community development program as well as of national extension services that is uh, extension of irrigation and electricity coverage to rural areas. So for these uh, socio-economic development projects, Balwant Rai Mehta committee recognized that Panchayati Raj providing a, a local self-governing platform are important for proper implementation. Consequently, in India, Panchayati Raj institutions were established with Rajasthan being the first state where it was established in 1959. But the structure of uh, these Panchayati Raj institutions, various tiers of Panchayati Raj institution as well as the process of election differed from state to state. This lacuna of lack of uniformity was addressed by the 73rd and the 74th Constitutional Amendment Act of 1992 which introduced a uniform and streamlined structure as well as uh, structure and composition of Panchayati Raj institutions as well as urban local bodies and at the same time it provided constitutional recognition to these institution as the third tier of governance. Apart from that, these amendments also introduced the 11th and 12th schedule in Indian constitution which entails the corresponding functions that should be devolved to Panchayati Raj institutions and to urban local bodies. That is the 11th schedule contains the functions that can be devolved to Panchayati Raj institutions and the 12th schedule contains a list of functions that can be devolved to urban local bodies. Now, this process of democratic decentralization uh, is still unfinished. And why is that? First of all, in the 73rd and 74th constitutional amendment, it also introduced Article 253M. This article specifically excluded 5th and 6th scheduled areas from implementation of these provisions. What were the reasons? It was due to the special nature of these 5th and 6th scheduled areas. 
fifth schedule areas were those areas which were uh, inhabited by aboriginal populations that were suffering from severe socio as well as economic and educational backwardness similarly the six schedule areas these areas were inhabited by tribes in the northeast which had not been able to assimilate themselves into the mainstream of indian society yet so with these uh, special considerations these areas were demarcated and these areas were governed with the principle of tribal panchil this principle essentially articulated that modernization and development should not be forced upon tribal population rather these communities these tribal communities should be allowed to pursue development and modernization according to their own genius and their own aspirations so it allowed uh, instead of imposing development on these uh, tribal societies it envisaged a society where tribals were themselves adopting and pursuing modernization so due to these factors special considerations were left uh, were uh, given to these areas and consequently 73rd and 74th amendment were not directly introduced in these areas however in 1996 panchayat extension to scheduled areas act pesa was passed and this act extended the provisions of panchayati raj institutions and urban local bodies to the fifth schedule areas as well however the quality of implementation continues to be debated till this date now apart from that some other issues that involve the northeast are uh, the issues of cultural autonomy this is uh, uh, inscribed in article 371a that deals to the special provisions related to the state of nagaland and article 371g which deals to the special provisions related to the state of mizoram now what are the special provisions that are inscribed in these uh, constitutional articles well for nagas and for mizos these provisions guarantee that their religious and uh, social practices will be preserved their customary law and procedure will be upheld uh, the civil and criminal justice will be administered in accordance with naga and mizo laws customary laws respectively and lastly the ownership and transfer of land and resources would be in accordance to the customary law now why is this a factor when it comes to democratic decentralization and extension of panchayati raj institutions and urban local bodies to these areas the issue is that uh, nagaland as we know just recently concluded its first urban local body polls in over 20 years that is after 2004 these were the first elections why because under the naga nagaland municipal act of 2001 this act was amended in 2006 to introduce 33% reservation for women however the naga community believe that this practice of reserving seats for women goes against their customary practices and consequently they tried to resist this implementation which is why for 20 years no elections were held in the state of nagaland and the same argument was put forth by several mizo groups with respect to this 125th constitutional amendment bill as well so it becomes important now that uh, elections have been conducted in nagaland as well it becomes another point for us to pursue and push forward this agenda of democratic decentralization for that sixth scheduled area that is that is the tribal areas as well so what is the current status of local self government under sixth schedule uh, first of all sixth schedule covers the following states that is assam meghalaya tripura and mizoram on the right of your screen you can see uh, various councils that have been established under this six schedules these are called autonomous district councils so the governor of these states is empowered to establish autonomous district councils 
to administer the areas falling under their jurisdiction in accordance with local practices. In addition to that, a governor can also create regional councils within one single autonomous uh, district council as well. Now, what is the structure of this council? As of now, 26 members of this council are elected while four are nominated by the governor. But as we can have, as we have a look at this map on the screen, we see that the areas falling under these uh, autonomous district councils are enormous. And these being represented by only 26 elected individuals is not really meeting this bar of democratic representation. So uh, this is another lacuna that only 26 elected members for one district council are there. This needs to be enhanced and uh, introducing village and municipal councils is one way to extend this democracy down to the grassroots as well. Apart from that, uh, under the present six schedule, there is no reservation for women and in essence, the true essence of self-governance is missing in these uh, six scheduled autonomous district councils. With this, we move on to the features of 125th uh, constitutional amendment bill these include the introduction of village and municipal councils across the autonomous districts that have been identified in addition to that this bill empowers the state finance commission to suggest measures to augment financial resources of uh, autonomous development councils as well as of village and municipal councils in addition to this it also provides for 33% reservation for women. And lastly, this is a means to ensure that the democracy penetrates down to the bottom, to the person standing last in the line as well. Now, what is the need for under this 125th Constitutional Amendment Bill? First of all, it is necessary to establish the third tier of governance throughout India. The PESA Act has done this for the fifth schedule areas and uh, with this 125th constitutional amendment bill the same is expected to be done for sixth schedule or tribal areas apart from that uh, introduction of these village and municipal councils is very important uh, it's a very important term under the bodo peace accord signed in 2020 between indian government assam government and bodo belligerents so wh what is exactly involved here under these Bodo Peace Accords, the erstwhile BTAD, that is Bodo Territorial Area District, was converted into Bodo Territorial Region, Bodo Land Territorial Region. However, Bodo's communi Bodo communities living outside this BTR, for them to get true democratic representation, uh, these village and municipal councils were one of the guarantees provided in this Bodo Peace Accords. So these, this amendment becomes important in line with the 2020 Bodo Peace Accords as well. And finally, this amendment will introduce financial, administrative and executive autonomy, which is something that needs to be considered due to the special cultural as well as geographical position of the Northeast. Now, this topic is again important for the upcoming mains 2024 examination. So try, uh, try this practice question discuss the role of grassroots level democracy in fostering national integration with special reference to northeast treat this as a 10 marker question and try to answer it in 150 words now we move to the third topic for the day that deals with states right to tax mining activities so supreme court has recently delivered a judgment on the mines and minerals development and regulation act of 1957 and has upheld that states can continue to tax mining operations as well. This topic is relevant for Indian economy and issues related to planning, mobilization, resources, growth, development and employment. And this, this is also important for GS2 with respect to the theme of not separation of powers, but federalism. So with this, 
we look into the constitutional provisions related to mining activities and this uh, division of powers between center and the states. So according to article 297, all minerals and resources in India's exclusive economic zone that extends to 200 nautical miles belongs to the union government. States have no claim over those uh, resources. Uh, apart from that, the seventh schedule lists down uh, entries in both union and state list. So the entry number 54 in union list, it deals that uh, the union parliament can exercise and regulate the mining sector in public interest. This is what the entry 54 states for union list. However, the entry 50 clarifies that taxes uh, uh, clarifies entry 50 of the state list clarifies that state governments do have this right to tax mining activities taking place in their jurisdiction based on these provisions mines and minerals development and regulation act of 1957 was passed this act created the architecture for mining operations and auctioning of mines in india so under this act, minerals are categorized into two categories. Firstly, the act mentions or identifies minor minerals for which states can auction the mining rights on their own. Whereas all other elements and minerals that are not mentioned in the category or the list of minor, uh, minor minerals, they are categorized as major minerals. And for them, auctioning and uh, allotting of mines can be taken up by both state as well as by center. So some examples of minor minerals include sand, quartz, jasper and similarly examples for major minerals will include coal, iron, bauxite. Now what exactly is the issue at stake here? It start, the issue started with the uh, perception of royalty that is under section 9 of the Mines and Minerals Development and Regulation Act of 1957, states were allowed to levy royalty on mines leased by them. However, uh, this became a question of interpretation that whether states, were, uh, states could only seek royalty for allo allocation of mines or can they tax the mining operations as well. This issue first came to light in the 1989 case of India Cement in which the Tamil Nadu government imposed a cess on, uh, cess on the tax on mining operations. It is in this India Cement case of 1989 that the Supreme Court stated that royalty equals to tax and that once royalty has been taken up, tax cannot be imposed by the state. Further, uh, however, in the 2004 case of Kesoram Industries case which dealt with West Bengal government trying to tax mining operations, the verdict from Supreme Court judges was that there is an error in the 1989 case and uh, royalty is not equal to tax. Rather, it questioned that the purpose of Section 9 of uh, Mines and Minerals Development and Regulation Act was to allow states to have an additional revenue source. That is, royalty could be uh, sought by states in addition to tax. So this was the argument given in the Kesoram Industries case. This argument again because of the already established judgment in India Cement case, uh, a nine, bench, nine judge bench was established to review the judgment uh, and the case comprehensively in the Mineral Area Development Authority case. And it is in this case that the Supreme Court has finally delivered a verdict which recognizes that royalty is not a tax. Royalty is an additional form of income for source and it is based on the uh, classic difference between royalty versus tax. So royalty essentially means a payment given in lieu of making use of someone else's resources. So as state is the owner of uh, minerals in their jurisdiction when they allow a private entity or some other entity to exploit these resources, they are in turn eligible to get royalty from these other entities. But 
taking royalty from these entities does not deprive the state of its uh, sovereign powers to tax mining operations as, as well. So this is the outcome that we have from this uh, Supreme Court judgment in the Mineral Area Development Authority case. Now, what is the significance of the verdict? Well, this verdict has great significance for India's mining sector across all minerals. Uh, the Niti Aayog strategy for New India 2022 highlighted that India has roughly 5.71 lakh square kilometer of obvious geological potential that is 5.7 lakh 71 lakh square kilometer of area in India is uh, possible to bear it it is expected that it bears mineral and geological resources out of this cumulative ob obvious uh, geological potential area only 10 percent has been explored till now and even out of this only 1.5 to 2 percent of area is currently being mining mined so india is uh, severely under efficient when it comes to extracting these resources and this judgment will allow state government to pursue uh, allocation of mines as one uh, for one reason that is to uh, get additional resources in form of royalty as well as taxes and the second imperative would be that it is going to pu uh, push exploitation and extraction of a wider range of minerals that are present in the state apart from that uh, this judgment allows the state governments to pursue an additional revenue stream as we know since the introduction of gst the sovereign fiscal space of states has constricted significantly and this judgment allows states to raise revenue from mining operations in both royalty as well as tax form now this judgment is also significant from the lens of distributive justice as we all may know uh, most of the mining districts of India are severely plagued by poverty, underemployment, poor health situations. So the revenue and resources generated through states taxing mining operations and getting royalties for leasing mines to them, these additional resources can be utilized to create a, uh, to propel socio-economic development in the mining districts as well. Lastly, uh, there are a series of cases that are pending in judiciary over this precise dispute whether states can tax mining operations and at the same time take royalty as well these disputes will now come to an end as india as supreme court has given a conclusive verdict over this issue so now with this this topic is again is important for both gs3 as well as gs2 so we can attempt this question which states illustrate how the principle of federalism continues to shape the division of powers between center and states with respect to taxation. So we will be having a look at how the division of powers with respect to taxation has continued to take place post independence with keeping the spirit of federalism intact. Treat this as a fifth, uh, 10 marker and try to write it in 150 words. Now taking up the fourth topic for the day Fourth topic is deals with the setting up of happiness committees by Kerala High Court. These committees were established uh, out of a chain of events that started due to the High Court scrutinizing into leaves taken by uh, judicial officers at district court and subordinate courts and it led to the recognition of the fact that a two-way communication in open and frank manner is important to ensure that the workload remains bearable and that grievances are addressed in timely manner. This topic is important for uh, GS2 part of the syllabus dealing with structure, organization and functioning of the executive and the judiciary. So coming to the topic, first of all, we have to understand what is the role of high courts in functioning of su subordinate courts. Well, according to Article 233, the appointment, posting and promotion of district judges is done by the governor in consultation with high court of the state 
Similarly, according to the Article 234, appointment to judicial services, that is, judicial officer posts, with the exception of uh, district judge, these appointments are again made by the governor in consultation with both High Court as well as State Public Service Commission. And lastly, Article 235 uh, entrusts the general supervision and control of all subordinate courts falling under the jurisdiction of respective state high courts to the respective state high courts. So with this, we get a clear idea that it is the state high court which is responsible in not just appointment of personnel to district and subordinate courts, but also ensuring that their conduct as well as their leaves are being taken in, in an appropriate manner. Now, this becomes important and why we see, why did the Kerala High Court feel it necessary to take a deeper look into the leaves of judicial officers working at district and subordinate courts? Well, it is important to understand the uh, issues that are plaguing subordinate and district courts in order to understand why the Kerala High Court felt it necessary to have a deeper look into the reasons why judicial officers at district and subordinate courts are taking more leaves than necessary or desirable. Well, the first issue is that of judicial pendency. Roughly 87.6% of 5 crore cases that are pending all over India, uh, out of these 5 crore cases, 87.6% cases are pending at subordinate court level. In addition to that, out of the sanction strength, there exists a vacancy of roughly 23% when it comes to personnel at district and subordinate courts. And lastly, the infrastructure situation at district and subordinate courts is even far worse than what it is at district at high courts. So when it comes to digital uh, equipment, to sanitation facilities, to proper chairs and ventilation, these things are not present and this constitutes a big strain on the energies of uh, judicial officers functioning in these courts. So with this we identify, if we link it to the constitutional duties that are entrusted to High Court, High Court is the proper forum to ensure decorum as well as discipline in district and High Courts. And for it is for this particular purpose, a happiness committee was established in Kerala by the name Welfare, Happiness and Professional Grievances of Judicial Officers of District Judiciary Committee. This committee is to be headed by a judge of Kerala High Court. So the purpose of this committee is to ensure that even the subordinates can voice their grievances to uh, the High Court in a fair manner without any fear of repercussions in order to ensure a free and open two-way communication. In addition to that, Kerala High Court has also instituted a mentor system for judicial officers. In this system, the state of Kerala has been divided into zones and uh, for each zone, a particular High Court judge has been appointed who is going to take uh, up the mentorship role for judicial officers in his or her particular uh, zone. Now moving to the last topic for the day that deals with AI and the environmental costs attached with it. As we know, India has started India AI mission and with that, uh, the budget introduced a, a couple of days back has allocated considerable resources for procuring 300 to 500 GPUs of capability, that is graphic processing units to boost India's AI development uh, strategy. However, there are severe costs involved uh, with this pursuit of AI-led development as well. So let's take a look at that. Well, first of all, AI does have a lot of uh, potential to bring revolutionary change in Indian economy. In fact, according to Ernst & Young, EAY a firm, consulting firm, it is estimated that AI can lead to a boost of almost $500 billion by 2030 in Indian economy. That is, it can create $500, $500 billion worth of economic activities on its own. So this is a considerable uh, opportunity for India, especially when it comes to the goal of turning India into a developed nation by 2047. But at the same time, 
we have to understand that environmental concerns continue to be of uh, great significance that cannot be ignored. So what are the costs involved? Firstly, it is first issue is that with increased use and deployment of AI, it is likely to lead in a proliferation of data centers. It is at these data centers that the data from across the world is stored and processed so that AI applications can function. Uh, it is going to lead to an increase in electricity consumption and uh, it is expected if we compare a search on open AI's chat GPT system versus a simple Google search, then the energy consumed and uh, by extension the emissions emitted for a search on open AI's chat GPT platform will lead to be 10 to 33 times more than the energy consumed or emissions emitted in a single Google search. So just imagine the magnitude if at all this development does play in India as well. In addition to that, these data centers as they consume more and more electricity, they also emit a lot of heat in their surroundings which creates a cooling requirement as well. So not just the process, it is not just the processing capabilities that consume energy, it is also the cooling requirements in these data centers which are constituting a significant burden on electricity consumption as well as greenhouse gas emissions. And lastly, this is the outcome that uh, the cumulative effect is that it is likely that there can be a substantial increase in uh, emissions across the world and it is it may even have some implications for developing countries like India as well. What we do see is that in few of the countries of the West, such as Ireland, which had been functioning uh, as a hub of MNCs due to a series of tax incentives, what we see here is a very disturbing trend that data centers constitute roughly 18% of the national electricity consumption. That is almost a fifth of the electricity consumption of Ireland is attributed to data centers. And imagine the consequences of such a scenario taking place in India where we are facing a sort of a regular energy shortage or a crisis. So this is something that has to be factored in when we are pursuing AI and this makes the vision of responsible AI that is championed by India. Responsible AI for development. that is championed by India, significantly important. It is expected that a process of sustainable AI can in fact have a counter effect. That is, it can even lead to a reduction in emissions globally. If the sustainability part is emphasized in this pursuit of AI development, this can lead to almost five to 10% decline in global emissions by 2030. In addition to that, it may very well also create. In addition to that, it is also expected that uh, sustainable AI can create resources of up to $1 trillion of services or of cost saves. So this again is the takeaway from this that while India pursues an AI led development pathway, it has to ensure that the sustainability in this AI process is not only emphasized, but also achieved. Now, with this, we move to the prelim snippets topics for the day. Uh, these are the topics that we are taking up. So first topic is uh, this issue of dichotomy between UGC, that is University Grants Commission and HEFA, that is Higher Education Financing Agency. In recent times, especially after the budget, there has been a criticism coming from the opposition that uh, funds allocation to UGC have been grossly reduced. This, it is alleged, is in stark contrast to national education policy of 2020, which emphasizes this goal that public funding for education should reach somewhere around 2.5% to 3% of GDP. So with at one level, we have a goal where national education policy implores the government to commit more resources from public finances to education, but the trend in budget is that 
the allocation for UGC has been declining consistently. In contrast to that, a new agency was created by the name Higher Education Financing Agency in 2017 and this is meant to mobilize resources from the market. So it would be providing resources that it has mobilized from the market and not from the government to meet the capital requirements of educational institutions. Now, UGC again was established in 1953 and it received statutory recognition in 1956 under the UGC Act of 1956. It has been mandated by the Act to establish minimum education standards for university education as well as to ensure coordination between states and center vis-a-vis -vis education policies. Uh, the objective for HEFA as we discussed is different. It is meant to ensure mobilization of market resources for capital requirement of education institutes. It was established as a joint venture between Ministry of Education and Canara Bank. And at the same time, it has a much broader coverage when it comes to uh, educational institutions vis-a-vis -vis the UGC. So the second issue is that of white category industries which have been exempted from seeking NOCs to establish uh, their plants or units. So these NOCs were required, that is no objection certificates were required from to be taken from state pollution control boards for agencies that are uh, polluting in nature. Now white category industries are those industries for which uh, who have a pollution index score of 20 or below. Now this pollution index is again uh, calculated on the basis of emissions that is air effluents, uh, air pollutants, effluents that is water or liquid pollutants, hazardous waste generated as well as the resources consumed. Based on a cumulative uh, index of these factors, a score is given for every industry and based on ranges predetermined such as these. So, uh, industries are categorized based on these ranges of pollution index scores. So if an industry has a pollution index score of 60 or more, it would be categorized as a red category industry. If an uh, industry has a score between 41 to 59, then it would be categorized as a orange category industry. And if it has a score of 21 to 40, then it would be categorized as a green category in industry. And those industries with a score less than 20 are categorized as white category industries and they are treated as practically non-polluting. So this is the reason why these white category industries have been exempted from uh, seeking NOCs before setting up their plants. The third topic for the day is uh, prelim snippet is NISAR that is NASA ISRO Synthetic Aperture Radar. This is a joint US Indian mission and it's a first of its kind mission because it is going to map Earth using two different frequencies that is the S band radar and the L band radar. Now it is a joint Indo US project so both the countries are uh, providing some of the constituent part, uh, parts of the mission. So what are they? Uh, the ISRO is going to provide S band radar along with the I-3K super uh, spacecraft bus, which is this bus. In addition to this, we, uh, the ISRO will also provide GSLV launch system for the mission. On the other hand, NASA is going to contribute the L-band radar for this joint mission. The satellite is going to be placed in low Earth orbit and it is expected to have a service life of three years. Now the last topic for the day is that of Listeriosis outbreak that has taken uh, that has uh, taken place in North America. So a uh, number of deaths have been reported and a unique thing is that the median age of those who have died is 75. That is it is affecting people who are of uh, age and beyond that much more uh, devastatingly. Now this disease is caused by Listeria monocytogenes which is a bacteria. This infection occurs due to consumption of contaminated food as this bacteria is present in soils, feces, water and it is easy to uh, contaminate and it is easy for it to contaminate food sources. Now the infections are of two types. 
Firstly, the first stage of infection is this intestinal infection. That is after consumption of contaminated food, the infection takes place in our intestine. However, if this intestinal infection uh, goes beyond intestine and starts to affect other parts of our body, then this becomes an invasive infection and can even be fatal. So the intestinal infection is relatively easier to cure. However, if that infection spreads to parts beyond the intestine and it becomes an invasive infection, then this can be fatal. The symptoms for the disease include vomiting, nausea, cramps, severe headache, constipation and fever. So this was it for today. I hope you had a fruitful session. Please feel free to reach out to us if you have any doubts. Thank you.